My name is Omri Alush. I had the research at Gondeo. I'm going to talk a lot about what the company does. And I also teach data science at Bar Ilan University. And I want to take you to 20 years back to what's probably a typical marketing uh, meeting. Where handsome people sit in a comfortable uh, sofa, uh, smoke a cigarette and drink a good whiskey. Um, and uh, with uh, the, the necessary uh, watery dial phone there and try to creatively think how you get into the mind and um, um, heart of the target audience. Moving back to our time, um, cigarettes and whiskey are probably still there, but the watery dial phone was replaced by all those dashboards, okay, trying to learn how different users react to the Facebook, Google ads, the different geographies, demographies, uh, and patterns. And what I argue is the same transformation is happening to sales. This is what we see at Gong. Now, we all used to the concept of sales as being an out. A salesperson is Leonardo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street. Okay? You're either born a salesperson or you never will be. But some things they make the, the field of sales into a good candidate into using data and getting better and better using data. Um, it's highly quantifiable. Sales people have their quota and their, uh, est and their uh, uh, benchmark all the time uh, according to their quota attainment. And they, at the end of the day, the check they take home is based on the commission they get from sales they make, and it's pretty obvious who's a good salesman and who's not, and we know when a call went well and when it didn't because at the end there is a sale or something didn't uh, go through and the, the uh, opportunity dropped. So we go and we record, transcribe, and analyze sales calls of B2B companies, business to business companies, think of Pinterest, a client, uh, selling uh, advertising spaces to other companies. And you start with just the order track. Okay, it's a single order track. We don't have a lot of information from that. And the first thing we do is realization. We look at different frames at times of several uh, milliseconds to one uh, second, and we extract features from that okay, that um, identify and characterize both the speaker and the channel in that specific uh, uh, time frame. And based on that, we can separate a single uh, a track into three different ones here. We don't know who the speaker is, but we know that in each track we have just a single speaker and we know the amount of time they spoke. The next step is what's called uh, speaker identification. And here we take the voice print, the um, cumulative voice print over the different uh, segments in the uh, uh, track and identify the speaker according to it. Okay? Still, we don't know who the speaker was, but we use a smart uh, uh, heuristic that works uh, really well. Uh, we have a collection of calls because we're recording many different calls of the company. And so let's say, for example, we have 10 different calls where we know the salesperson was invited, was part of the call, but we're not, we don't know which one he was in the different tracks that we have. Was he speaker A or speaker B in each of these calls? And what we do is extract the voice print of the speaker of, for each of these channels in each of the calls and look for similarities. And when we do hierarchical clustering, glomerative clustering, we can see that we have a group of calls with, uh, of tracks in calls with very similar uh, voice prints, okay? And uh, other speakers have nothing in common because these are different uh, people that attended the different calls but they are not shared in any way. This allows us to identify the speaker and provide uh, the identification that provide here both the name of the person and their affiliation. Are they, are they with the company or part of the client, uh, the client uh, uh, team? Next step is automatic speech recognition. Okay? Um, and this is something that many people are surprised to learn that we do in-house and don't rely on a third-party tool. It's a big endeavor, but it's definitely something that you can do today. Uh, just for comparison, so we understand why we need to do it in-house, I took a call that was made almost three years ago when the company just started and it was actually called Honeyfy. 
And we use the uh, third party solution for that. And um, let's quickly read this. And what they're seeing is some gate with holy sees this tool being being used. You see this wall set back, negative tool for incest. Okay. I honestly I didn't take the time to listen to it, but I'm pretty sure nobody said incest in this uh, in this uh, occasion. Um, if we look at what we do when we have uh, in-house uh, ASL today, uh, you can see that it makes sense, although the sentence itself is not grammatically perfect. So keep an eye out here in the meantime, do you think the CSV, given that it's all linked in data, would that be helpful? And the uh, speech recognition engine knows to identify that CSV is an acronym, uh, standing for a file format, LinkedIn is a company name with a capital letter. Um, the reason we got bad results here is that these things are usually trained on um, uh, free, uh, free sources. Uh, for example, TV shows. So, war is probably because in CNN transcripts, war appears a lot. And incest is probably because they use Jerry Springer shows uh, to, get, to get the data. Another step is to uh, restore the punctuation. The speech recognition engine does not provide us with the uh, punctuation mark, the space, commas, dots, etc. Um, we use a, a, a neural network here, uh, doing sec to sec with uh, a bidirectional LSTM, and restore this information. And it allow, allows us to also, sorry, also um, better identify questions, okay, and identify the sources of information that are uh, provided in the conversation. We also do video frame uh, classification. Uh, we look at the video frame and we analyze it, uh, each image by image, and then uh, 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 cumulatively, and separate it into a webcam, a browser demo, a presentation slides, or just some you know, uh, Skype for business uh, 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 screen in the meantime. And based on this, we can give a recommendation. What's better? When you're talking to someone and trying to sell, is it better to share your camera so the person sees you? Or is it better to give a demo of the, the system? Maybe the deck that your company uses, uh, the PowerPoint deck, is the best solution. We have the data. We have uh, the annotations. And based on these things, we can provide actual recommendations to uh, salespeople. We enrich the conversation with lots of different uh, aspects, the topics, for example. Are we having a small talk now at the beginning or end of the conversation? Are we actually talking about pricing now or the next steps? Um, we track all mentions of competitors and other interesting uh, uh, tracks. Um, we follow questions or objections, and we can tell you if uh, what are the main objections that clients generally have um, uh, with uh, your product and uh, many other things uh, that basically give us an overview of both what's happening in a single conversation but also allow us to give recommendation to a specific salesperson of what they need to do and what's better um, and how they can improve based on all the data that we collect. So we take a lot of different sources, different analyzers and all of those go into a single uh, uh, pipeline that provides both uh, recommendations for the long term coaching, but also uh, uh, productivity insights into a single conversation. So I want to share with you a few of the insights that we've learned uh, for analyzing over one million uh, sales calls. And the first one is really obvious, but it's nice to see that the data supports uh, uh, what you, at least intuitively, think. Listening is way more important than talking. If we look at, yeah, take that home with you. It's definitely some of these things you can take back to the, your uh, wife or husband. Um, if we look at what startups do, okay, they uh, listen more than they talk. They talk for about 50% of the time of the call. If you look at those that are not uh, high on the, the charts, the bottom performing sales rep uh, representatives, they talk for 30, uh, three quarters of the time. This means that a client gets to talk twice as much when he's talking to a good sales rep than uh, he is uh, when he's talking to a bottom performing one, and it's very important. Another metric 
is how long we let the customer talk without interruptions. And here as well, the longer we let the customer talk, the better our chances of closing the deal. The next step is also something that you can take home with you, have balanced back and forth dialogues, we, we call them coffee shop conversations. The more switches you have between speakers, remember we separated our audio track into the different speakers, so we can see how much time you talk and how many transitions there are between the salesperson and the, um, the prospect. The more changes you have, the better chances you have of closing the deal. So this is bad, because people are talking and talking, and this is way better, and we see it over and over. But when a person gets that, not just as a general um, best practice in the field, they get their talk ratio, they get the number of transitions they have on a weekly basis, they learn to get better. I said, uh, I've mentioned that we also track uh, the questions, and we can also see when people ask questions. So uh, we see that average sales representatives ask most of the questions in the beginning of the call, and the star reps ask them throughout the call. So also take this home with you, not, how are you, how was your day, uh, is everything fine? Uh, okay, spread those out. I think here it's probably the first thing that you shouldn't take home, don't talk to your wife or husband about competitors. Um, but in business orientation, competitors are actually good. We see that, at least in the early stage, the first calls, if you talk about competition, the more you talk about competition, the higher close rates you have. Now remember, it's not um, somebody trying to sell you a manui for a ma'ariv. Uh, these are business people making big business decisions, hundreds of thousands of dollars involved. The more they know about the field, the, the higher chances they will say, okay, we can use your uh, solution, we understand why you are better than the others for uh, our specific case, and uh, we'd like to make a deal with you. Another very important and very interesting uh, pattern that we see is uh, rhythm dictation. So, along with all of those things, we can actually track the talking speed of people. And Malcolm Gladwell, one of the uh, biggest influencers in the world of marketing and sales, uh, says that part of what it means to have a powerful personality is that you can draw others into your own rhythms and dictate the terms of the interaction. Okay? And it's very interesting to see this because if you look at the talking speed okay, in calls of average reps, uh, the, the salesperson always speaks faster and more energetically than the client. Okay? We have, in the office, we have salespeople, they have uh, uh, tables that can go up or down. And when they start a conversation, they stand up and with all the energy, try to get the, the person excited. How are you, Nitzanin? Something like that. Um, and we can see that they, they maintain the same uh, um, talking speed and the client kind of keeps the same thing. When we look at what top is, the top sales uh, people do, it's quite amazing. See how fast the client adapts the talking speed to that of the salesperson, okay? They have the personality or the way to get people to match them and dictate the rhythm and take control of the conversation. Do you have more time? Cool. So, something very important to do is talk business, okay? And this is something we see when you do a topic modeling. We track what people are talking about in each part of the conversation. So it's not just the interactivity or uh, how many questions you ask, it's, it's what we talk about the level of granularity. And we see that uh, the star reps, the um, great uh, sales uh, people, talk much more about things that are related to the business. So examples are the ROI, the return on investment. Why? What you would get by purchasing this solution. Um, understanding the business challenges of the prospect. Or talking about the actual agenda and timeline of their work and what needs to be done understanding who makes the decision and what needs to actually close the deal, and talking uh, much more about the values and the features. This is something very interesting. It's known in the business community, but never really, um, nobody really shared data about that. And we see that if you're talking about the features of your product, you have much uh, lower chances of making the sale. If you talk about talking about the value, okay, and the benefits that it brings, 
Okay? Then you're actually making making difference. Because we're tracking price, uh, the topics, uh, and when they're used in the conversation, we can also learn when it's best to discuss pricing. And this is something that's very related to how you control the conversation. So we see that uh, the average reps talk about pricing in, in uh, orange, talk about pricing pretty much all through the conversation. Okay? There are some spots where they talk about it much more, but it's not a huge difference. When we, we, we look at what star reps do, star uh, salespeople, we see that there is a time pretty close to the end of the conversation, but it's not the, the final thing. They've established the values. They've talked about okay, all the objections. They've handled everything that they should, and then they talk about pricing. And when people look at these things, they understand what they are doing uh, differently than the others and what can be improved. So I hope that I'd be happy to elaborate on some of the algorithms that we use. Uh, but basically, what I hope to show you is that um, there's a lot of opportunity in the field now to take data from different algorithms and different methods and put it together into a system that transforms a specific uh, industry. Uh, one thing that I get asked a lot, and, and it's quite interesting, and I think it's important for us as data scientists and data analysts, is the reaction uh, of salespeople into something like this. Okay? Because the, the basic intuition we would have probably is that I know what I'm doing, I'm a, an artist, nobody is going to replicate me, replace me, or anything like that. But it's quite surprising to see that when you let people know some of the things that they can do better, or let them even just listen to calls of other salespeople that handle objections differently, okay, that have more experience, that might give them some ideas they really like the tools that we provide. Um, it's very important not to force them into a specific method, give recommendations, try to provide guidelines, but when you show somebody data, it's very, very powerful. Thank you. Any questions? Did you try to use this for training uh, salespeople? Because some of the things you 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 uh, showed, it's not clear if if uh, the behavior uh, interaction is the result of the customer more interested in the product or that the salesperson is, is better. So it's not sometimes clear to know. Like when you say that. The customer talks more, maybe he talks more because he's interested in the product more, not because the salesperson let him to or encourages him to talk more. So, so uh, thank you. Um, you. You've asked pretty much uh, two questions, I'll try to answer both of them. One is that when we analyze things, uh, we try to uh, correct for all any confounding uh, uh, factors that we can take into account. And we look at both what top salespeople do and what moves uh, a, a deal f uh, forward. So we, we are pretty confident with some of the most of the recommendations we have. And when we're not, we have you know we provide them with uh, you know a, dis a disclaimer saying that these things uh, aren't based on enough data, but we see some pattern. Okay, we use it a lot for um, uh, coaching new new hires. Um, it's very important in this field because if your company is doing extremely well and you have 100 salespeople but you want to go to 200 now, you know that the first few months are just coaching. But then the deal, okay, closing the deal takes four, five, six, even eight months. And during this time, if you don't have something like this that shows you the differences in patterns and uh, behavior, you're going to wait for one full year. And then at the end of that time, you're going to lay off 80% of uh, your salespeople because they didn't get, en get enough insights. And our platform allows uh, organizations to say, OK, now let's hear calls. Let's look at what you can do differently, OK? And um, get better using actual data. Um, sorry. Now, presumably, you use this to coach salespeople at all levels. Does the gap between the poor salespeople and the better salespeople get bigger or smaller? 
in other, in other words, do the good guys get much better and the poor people just incremental improvement or does the gap get smaller? Um, sadly or, or uh, happily, I don't even know uh, how to say that, we're a pretty young company and we don't have enough data to uh, answer for that. We've been around for just two years. Um, I think that the important thing that we see is uh, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, it's a win-win situation. And if the great salespeople sell more and uh, one perform one ones, uh, ones just get slightly better, it's still good for the organization. Um, but most of what we see is that the big gap is between what is is uh, time to coach. Most organizations focus on what how they can uh, coach the average people. Okay, not the top, not the stars, not the bottom performing, but actually the middle of the pack. This is where the most of the game, most of the game can be get, uh, achieved. Uh, regarding uh, training, do you use the results from the statistics, like uh, uh, talk about the price at the end, to go through the database, find a typical call, and use it for training? We do. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, we don't do this automatically, we, we you know, give some recommendations. Um, one of the things that we see clients do is kind of like take a, a good or a bad call, it doesn't really make a difference, put, uh, get everybody in a big uh, conference room and do like a roast, uh, is that the name of the, the show, roast? They just listen to the show and say, you've done an awful uh, work here or this was really good. So even something like this without all the AI is used for training, um, what our system also allows you to do is pinpoint a specific calls that requires your attention if you're the VP of sales of a big organization. Uh, thank you for the presentation, which is very interesting. Uh, do you measure the impact on the business actually? Like how much the, how much the companies uh, sold more? Yeah, as I've said, we don't have enough information regarding this, uh, but we are seeing for the few cases that we have very good uh, uh, correspondence. Um, and one of the metrics, you know, for any company like our SaaS company, we have a very, very high, uh, uh, very, very low churn rate, very high continuation rate. Customers are very happy. Can you share like the order of magnitude and how much? You know, in how much in percentage it improves the sales? Certainly not. <coughs> Last question. Have you any uh, algorithm that can extract any conclusion or uh, resume uh, about what is uh, talking? You mean the topic of the, the, the call or the segment of the call? To extract, uh, to extract knowledge of any resume about what is talking in the, in the conversation. You mean summary? Uh, yes. So, um, as I've mentioned, we extract the topic. So if you look at the call, usually in a sales call, People are talking for 30 minutes, one hour. They go over many different topics, and our platform identifies the different topics in small segments of time. So we know that between uh, minute 24 and minute 30, they talk about the uh, coaching feature of Gong, for example. Does that answer the question? Uh, I'm a little still concerned about the first question, which is the causality. Uh, couldn't it be that some of these features uh, have causality because they are causing uh, the closing of the deal, but some others are actually the result of being able to close the deal? So, for example, if, if I'm not successful in persuading you, we will never get to discuss the price uh, as much as the successful salesman, so that's actually the result and not the cause. And the same for uh, the interactive dialogue. So uh, have you tried like learning um, from all these discussions and using uh, some of the uh, sophisticated learning methods discussed today in order to actually decide 
on the arrow of causality of these features and the target? Yeah, great question. Um, basically, we have a lot of data, but not a huge amount of data. And we collect for all of the factors that we can take into account in order to better understand that we don't have factors that are changing. There's a high risk of, you know, just uh, uh, biases in the, in the analysis. Uh, for example, um, even something like uh, the talk ratio that I've mentioned, okay, top salespeople, okay, get to l later stages of uh, deals, in later stages they don't have to show the, uh, the demo of the product, they discuss the price, later stages have a lower uh, talk ratio for the AE, and then just by this you get a pattern that's similar to what I've said, I've shown, I hope I made myself clear. We, f we correct for all of those things, Okay, which is one thing, and we only look for, uh, only show statistically significant things after correction. Um, and uh, we also try to see, you know, for a specific sales per person, what he does in different calls, and also correct for that, the identity of the sales person. We always have the question of causality uh, and uh, correlation. Um, I think that the interesting thing here in the industry, okay, is that it's not that we have to do some factor analysis and graph uh, analysis and try to entangle everything. The recommendations that we give uh, either resonate or not, and we see that they quite well resonate with what the company is trying to achieve, and then they decide if they want to use them and when they want to use them, they constantly monitor the, the impact. So um, perhaps some of the things the, the, uh, the, the things that we show with lower uh, statistical significance aren't actual causes, but sometimes showing them would be a cell gate, helping the salesperson get better in something that really makes a difference and improve. And we see that even if we are not you know, at the zero angle, we'd be at 15 or 20, not 180 degrees. A great question. Thank you very much. Professor Mark Last will have the closing remarks. Okay. It's good uh, that uh, some people stayed at you, uh, the last talk. Uh, I'm really happy to see again uh, so many participants. We had a few hundreds uh, here uh, this year, like the last year. And uh, it's time to say uh, thank you first to my colleagues, uh, Professor Bracha Shapira, Professor Leo Rokach, of course, all excellent uh, speakers that we have today. The audience, without you, there will be no point to make it happen, okay? Uh, and uh, we, we also had a team of people who assisted us uh, technically, administratively, uh, Shosh, uh, we have Shosh, we have Eti, Sergei, Wells, Moran, Noga, uh, uh, Noah. <laughs> uh, ah, yeah, <laughs> in the comment. Uh, all of you did, uh, did a great job today and uh, during the month when we prepared for this conference, and we hope uh, to see all of you again next year. Thank you very much for coming.